So the drum set that we know and love today came about when people that played these instruments separately in a concert band setup or a marching band setup decided to start combining them into a configuration where they could all be played by one person. So this big bass drum that looked like this in those other situations was moved down into this position on the floor where it can be played with your foot, which is why we call it a kick drum today. All right, now the parts of the kick drum. The drum itself, we call this shell. These are the wood hoops which hold on the heads. This would be the resonant head on the front of the drum. The other drum head which you actually strike is called the batter head. These hoops are held on by these claw hooks. Through the claw hook, you can see a tension rod. That's the part that you turn, tighten or loosen it to tune the drum. The tension rod goes into a lug the lug is inside of the lug casing, which is this decorative part here. Lots of kick drums will have a mount on them for a rack tom arm, or sometimes they'll have one over here for a ride cymbal stand. And the last bit is the feet down here. The foot, which keeps it upright and stable. And these are also sometimes called a spur because there will be a little metal spike sticking out the bottom of them to keep your kick drum from sliding as you play it. Okay, so how do we talk about kick drum sizes? Well, you've got the diameter and you've got the depth. Those are two bits to think about. The diameter is the size that we most often talk about. I play a pretty normal size rock and roll kick drum and the diameter on mine is 22 inches. Very, very common. This is the size that you'll be using when you shop for drum heads. 22 inch diameter is very normal for rock sizes. Now, they go smaller, of course. You get a 20 inch or an 18 inch and you can turn just about anything into a kick drum. The smaller the diameter, the higher the pitch. So a lot of jazz players will play something a little smaller because it's a little bit quieter as well. And a lot of big heavy rock players will some play something bigger because it's a deeper pitch and a little bit louder. A great example of this is Tommy Lee from Motley Crue. For a little while, he was playing a truly ridiculous 42 inch kick drum. And there was another time when his secondary kick drum was a slightly less ridiculous 32 inch kick drum. Some very big drums. Now, the other measurement is the depth. And when we're talking about depth, we're talking about the depth of the shell itself, not the hoop to the hoop. So on my drum, the shell itself is 16 inches deep. Again, pretty standard depth for rock and roll sizes. They of course get deeper. Now, when you're considering the depth, this is what affects the body of your tone. So something that's a little shallower is going to have sort of a, a thinner sounding, less full body to the tone. And as it gets deeper and deeper, it's going to be a fatter sounding, more rounded, full bodied sound coming out of the drum. So those are the things to keep in mind when you're choosing a kick drum. Diameter for pitch, high or low. Depth for body, thinner or fatter. So at this point, you may have noticed that the resonant head of my bass drum has a big hole in it. Now remember the resonant head is the front head of the drum, the one that you don't hit, and it's called the resonant head because it resonates or vibrates or rings when you strike the batter head. So as you would expect, when there's a hole in the resonant head, it affects how much that head will resonate. Now I have what comes on Yamaha drums, which is this uh, front head that's got really a pretty big hole in it. Like I would say, I don't know, a 10 inch diameter hole in this front head. That's pretty sizable. Now what that means is that there's not a lot of resonance going on with my kick drum. It's sort of all attack and not a whole lot of uh, long ringing body to it. Now, this is really good for me and my setup for the most part, because when you've got a lot of attack, it allows you to do almost anything you want with it later on in the DAW. But it's an option and it's something to consider. And I've been thinking about it a lot lately because I'm about to record an album and I think I'm changing this head. I would like something with a little smaller hole and they make lots of smaller versions that you can buy sort of aftermarket and install into your own drum head. They make them, I think, as far down as like a three inch size and all the way up to a six, in, six inch size. They're commonly referred to as portholes. And uh, there are even some drummers that will put multiple smaller holes 
in the resonant head of their drum. So as you decide how you want to handle the resonant part of your kick drum, you can do anything from no head at all, which will give you no resonance, as you would expect, to a full solid drum head, which is something that will make it so you need to be a little more considerate when you tune it, but it will also give you a nice tonal resonance to your kick drum, which is a little different than the very dead sound that you can get with a big hole or with no drum head at all. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that your choice of resonant head and your choice of holes in your resonant head is going to affect the mic techniques that will be available to you, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. But first, tuning. So when it comes to tuning and dampening, you've got a few things to consider. And we're going to start with the batter head. That's the one that you hit. So the first choice you can make is a clear or a coated batter head. As you can see on mine right now, I've got a coated version. And the biggest difference between a coated drum head and a clear drum head is that a coated drum head is gonna give you a warmer, more sort of classic tone. And a clear drum head is gonna give you a more precise and cutting tone uh, with a little more attack. So my option was to go with the coated drum head. But that's a choice you're going to have to make. They also make these with a whole different series of sort of uh, thicknesses and plies, and a lot of them have built-in dampening rings around the edge. So that's something to consider. There are a multitude of options. You can also see on mine that I've got this patch right where the beater hits the drum head. Now that's there for a couple different reasons, but basically it is meant to increase the lifetime of the kick drum head. So it makes it so you go through drum heads a little slower and it protects it, but it's also gonna change the sound a little bit. And they make versions of these of metal plates in them so you can get a very clicky and attacky sound. Again, lots of different options with your kick drum patches. Another thing to consider when you're tuning or dampening your kick drum is how do you play the drum? Now it's very common for drummers to play either beater on the head, looks like this. That's when you hit and bury the beater into the drum head. And the other option is to play beater off the head, which is where you hit and let the beater come off the head. Sort of like that. Now that makes a very big difference in your tone and it's gonna change the way that you tune and dampen your kick drum considerably. If you've got a solid resonant head and you've got it tuned for wide open sounds and you try to bury the beater, there's a good chance that it's going to kick back at you and make a bunch of little rebounds that you didn't expect. So instead of a clean hit, you're going to get pop, 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 pop. Now that's just because there's a lot of air trapped inside the drum. Meanwhile, if you have a big hole in the resonant head or no resonant head at all, and you go to play beater on, it's going to make one clean sound because all the air pushes out through the drum instead of coming back at you. So consider your playing style. Beater on, you may want a little more dampening, a little looser tuning, and a hole in the resonant head. Beater off, you may want a little less dampening, a little tighter tuning, more tone, more pitch, and uh, a solid resonant head. You'll also, of course, have to consider how the drum heads are tuned in relation to one another. And there are an absurd amount of options, opinions, techniques, and styles to how you can tune those heads. Now that we've talked about tuning, let's look at some dampening. And I'm going to fly you inside my kick drum so you can see the hilarious dirty old blanket that I've got crammed in here for some dampening purposes. Now this is the poor man's solution. I have a blanket and I crammed it in here. Now you can see that there will be some differences based on how much of it you have touching the batter head and how much of it you have touching the resonant head. That's gonna make a difference to the sound. And of course they make some products that look and perform a little better than a crusty old blanket that I found in the closet. And you'll be able to see several different options of how those systems are put together. Um, the one that's coming to mind right now is made by Evans and they make a version where you can sort of stack more or less of them together and they have little flaps that'll rest up against the batter head or the resonant head the exact amounts that you like so you really have a lot of options as far as how to dampen your kick drum basically what dampening a kick drum does is it lets you adjust the amount of ringing and overtones that occur when you hit the drum 
So the more dampening you put in there, the less ringing and the less overtones you're gonna hear every time you hit. And finally, mic techniques. Now you can see on my setup right now, I've got two microphones in or near the kick drum anyway. On the outside, an AKG D12 VR. On the inside, an AKG D112 Mark II. Okay, so this is a pretty common miking setup. One in, one out. It would look a little different if I had a fuller resonant head. You can adjust the in mic. The closer it is to the batter head, the more attack you're gonna get. The farther away, the more body you're gonna get. And that's kind of the concept. The outer mic is supposed to provide more of the body of the drum. The inner mic is supposed to provide more of the attack of the drum. And in a funny experiment, I even have a C214 back here distance miking the kick drum to see what kind of sounds that comes up with. Now there are a few other options for miking and resonance adjustments. The most popular one is what they call a sub kick. A uh, sub kick when it's made by Yamaha, there are I think a couple other uh, brand name versions of it. But basically a speaker and a microphone are kind of the same thing. A speaker is a backwards microphone and a microphone is a backwards speaker. So these sub kicks are small speakers, generally like a six inch or an eight inch driver that are wired up to work backwards, kind of like a microphone. So a lot of times uh, people will put them in a little tiny drum shell so it kind of looks like a small drum positioned in front of the kick drum. That's a sub kick. It's basically a modified speaker that works like a microphone. Now there is also a kick drum enhancement that I wanted to show you that sometimes people use where it's basically another thinner kick drum full diameter but thinner in depth that is attached to the front of the main kick drum and this is called a resonator or uh, they have lots of other names for it a resonator a subwoofer people call them all kinds of different things but basically it's a second drum attached to the front of your kick drum the version i can think of that will show you is from the kiss drum set for the past i think handful of years i'm not sure which drummer so i'm not going to say but uh the kiss drum set for a while was wearing some pretty cool looking sub kicks on the bass drums that's it for everything you've ever wanted to know about bass drums if i missed anything please hit the comment section below and let me know your thoughts also like and subscribe so you can make sure you don't miss any of the upcoming content on my channel you can follow me over on instagram at dirty bandana and get all the details for everything else that i'm up to on my website at dirtybandana.com that's all for now we'll see you all next time